the institutions that exist to support and sustain dominance of men, even if it's a so-called gentle dominance, but as women who are victims of sexism in society, as people of color who are victims of racism, uh, as young people, uh, now it was ageism and, and, and then the class issue, there's not too much luxury that we have to be engaged in activity that doesn't seek to destroy the things that destroy love. We don't have that. I don't believe that we do. Some people might want to make that option, but I believe that every fiber of our being, every single thing that we do, must be passionately connected to righteousness and getting rid of the things that would stop these isms that show up in our lives, even when we don't know they show, show up. There's a such thing as internalized racism. There's a such thing as internalized sexism. We, we bite into, we, we get connected with behavior that is self-destructive and we defend it. We can't even articulate it, but we defend it. So because of that, I am passionately always involved in anything that is, that wants to, that seeks to destroy blockage. I was with Susan Taylor um, recently, and I, and I told her, I would quote her, she now has the National Cares Mentoring Project, I believe is the name of it, and she gave a speech uh, recently, and I'm honored and blessed to have a talking relationship with her. And she gave a speech that talked about the need for young people, people, period, older people, adults, to be involved with mentoring for the sake of black mentor, people mentoring um, African Americans being involved in mentoring. Um, and she said, I would get on the floor and roll over and bark like a dog if I thought that meant that you would get up and do something that was other than yourself, other than self-serving, other than you know, uh, just doing something because it felt good to you. But, it, but how do we make our lives beyond our own issues, our problems, our challenges, but how do we make them mission bound? And I think that we should figure out the how. The biggest question is why we should do it. We can always ask the question how, and I'll close in a moment. The question of how to do something is the easiest question in the world. Because when you say how, what are you talking about? You're talking about process, right? You're talking about policy and procedure and structure. You can always figure out a way to get the policy in place, to figure out what your priorities are, and to figure out what is the next step. That is what how is. That is an operational question. Is everybody with me so far? The deeper question is why you should do something. If you can figure out why you should be involved in student government, why you should be involved in a community-based organization, why you should be involved in something other than yourself that benefits your community or your family, if you figure out the why, I guarantee you, as someone who's been in business for 15 years, been a self-employed individual for 10 years, as a matter of fact, my anniversary is today. I left my day job 10 years ago, because my uncle told me to, April, if you throw your wallet over the fence, you will guarantee you will always have money. Can you all get with that analogy? If you throw your wallet over the fence, there I was trying to figure out, do I leave my day job? What if I don't get the, the, the roster of clients that I need? The, that struggle that you have. If you throw your wallet over the fence, if you take the risk, you will find a way to get the wallet, to get the question of how answered, but the why is important. So my thing is to you, ask that question first, why you should be doing something. The process will show up. So on that note, I wanna close, and hopefully I've left something for you to think about, to ponder, and even to question. Dynamic Miss Christina K. Christina, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm definitely good. How does it feel to be here at Medgar? It feels great to be here at Medgar. Um, you know, I just spoke. I just did my thing, and I actually, you know, I felt I felt like I might have touched some people tonight. You know, so if I touch some people, I, f I feel good, and that's that's what I came. I came to touch people. It wasn't about me. It was about you know saying something that could have possibly helped some of the students. All right. So my name is Christina K. 
I know most of y'all probably haven't heard of me before. Maybe you got a chance to check everything out um, that was in the program. You maybe got to read a little bit about me. Um, I'm an artist. I'm not originally from New York. I'm originally from Maryland, D.C. area. I moved up here about four years ago and just really got on my grind, started making it happen. Um, I'm on my second single right now. It's called Tonight. With me and my team, we've been getting a lot of radio airplay on that, um, top 40 stations, urban stations. My first single that I released last year, um, it was called I Got a Boyfriend, and pretty much was the same situation, um, where I was able to just really create a movement with me, a small team, believing in myself. Um, I'm in a couple of magazines that's out right now. Earlier this year, I had a feature in um, Black Beat Magazine. I'm in the YRB Magazine that's out right now. Um, I just did an interview with Billboard Magazine about two days ago. I uh, got something coming up in Double XL, and I have a licensing agreement with MTV. And all this stuff has happened within the past year, so I'm just thankful that, you know, Mr. Jimmy invited me to come out and speak with you guys. So it's not like I'm some, like, crazy big superstar, and I don't think like I'm some crazy big superstar. I'm really just a lot like you guys. I just had something that I believed in, and I really just worked really, really hard to, to make it happen. So I'm on a path to make it happen, so that's why I'm here to encourage you guys on your way and tell you about me and the different steps that I made, and hopefully whatever it is that you dream to do or, or want to do that you can make it happen too. So it all started out, um, I was a little girl, grew up in uh, PG County, Maryland, like suburbs of DC, kind of like a, not city, just kind of like a rural sort of city ghetto, weird suburb ghetto type of place. So I grew up with single parents. Um, my mom was like 16 when she had me. My dad was 17, he was in jail. So my mom dropped out of school, um, had me. Growing up, we lived with our parents, our family. It was like kind of off a little bit. I don't know if anyone can relate, but it, it wasn't picture perfect. It was a lot of drinking and people, you know, getting high and doing a lot of stuff that wasn't necessarily like great things. So me seeing that stuff growing up, I really didn't want to like go that route. Seeing all that, I kind of was like, this is not really like the path that I want for me. So I just really started like dreaming and just thinking of different things. I'm my only child, so that's kind of how I developed the relationship with music, because that's really kind of all I had. And I would just listen to music and zone out and write little poems and write little songs and stuff like that just to kind of escape a lot of the stuff that was going on. So I'm a little kid. I'm like five or six. I'm writing poems. I see like Salt and Pep on TV. I think they like the hottest thing I've ever seen. So then I decided that I wanted to rap. Um, I'm rapping or whatever. I'm little though, I'm like six or seven, so it's all fairly new. So my parents, my, my friend's parents, they see me and they're like, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? I'm like, yeah, I want to be a rapper. So my friend's mom looked at me, she was like, you want to be a rapper? She's like, that's not a real career. She's like, the only rapper you're going to be doing is rapping sandwiches at McDonald's. I'm like, oh. So it kind of hurt my feelings a little bit because it's like great career plan that I thought I had is like six years old, it kind of got crushed. So I'm like, okay, well, I guess that's not a real career. So my family would still give me like keyboards and stuff for Christmas and I would still write my little poems and make my little beats with one finger on the keyboard thinking I was doing something. But it was just enough that, you know, I was a little kid so I was having fun. So time goes on, time goes on, time goes on. I get to high school. I really don't know what I want to do. I really don't know what I want to be. I wasn't really like focused. I mean, I managed to graduate, but it wasn't like I was a A student or really a B student. I kind of just coasted through because school really didn't keep my interest like that. So I didn't know what to do. I said, well, I guess I'll go to the college up the street and maybe, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll graduate and I'll try to figure it out and we'll see what happens. Around that time, um, I think that's like when Timberland had the stuff with Aaliyah and, or, and like Genuine. And so I heard those sounds that he had, like babies crying and elephant noises and stuff like that. And it like bugged me out because I had never heard anyone use sounds like that in music before. So I was like, man, whatever this guy is doing with this music, I have to learn how to do that. So I was like, well, maybe I want to learn about production. Maybe I could do that. I'll go to college. I'll, 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 I'll go to college, I'll graduate, then I'll save money, then I'm like, I'm gonna build a studio, then I'm gonna move to New York, and then maybe I'll be an a and Cause even if I was like, I can't be an artist, I just had to be around music. So I'm like, okay, that's the plan. So I got the college, um, the college around my way. It's called um, Bowie State University around where I grew up. It's a historically black college. So I went there, I wasn't really digging it. I mean, it was cool, I went, I managed to show up and 
you know, try to do the best that I could, but it really wasn't, it really wasn't uh, popping as hard as it was popping for other people. <laughs> so I met another girl when I was there that was from Baltimore, and so she was rapping. So me and her started kicking it, so then I started rapping too. So I'm like, okay, I'm back on my rapping. This, this is where it's at. So I managed, I still, you know, that was part of the reason made me want to go to school now, because I had a homie that I could relate to, and we rapping, and we kicking it, and we funning, whatever. So I'm out in the club one night, I meet this guy from Philly, he's a producer. He actually still like makes tracks for like Freeway or something now, but I haven't been keeping in touch with him. So I meet him one night in the club, he's trying to talk to me, kick it to me or whatever. I really wasn't really trying to kick it to him, but when he told me he was a producer, I'm like, oh for real, like, well I got songs, let's get together. So we go, and I go later on hook up with him. So he has like a studio, like a home studio. I know everybody knows like a home studio. It's like now drum machines and keyboards. But that was my first time ever seeing somebody with stuff like that. I didn't even know what the equipment was that made music. So I see all this stuff, and I'm like shocked, and I'm sitting there, and I'm just looking at this stuff, and I'm just staring at everything. And I remembered the name that was on every, every machine that he had, and I remembered the name. So we did like two or three songs. So I'm like, okay, cool, cool. I love that the songs were good, and I, I felt like I had my swagger back. I'm like, man, I'm recording songs now. I'm not losing music again. Like, forget what anybody said. I, this is what I'm doing. So I go home, I get on the internet. I start looking up the different names of the stuff that I saw. I'm like, okay, Akai, oh, try. Cork, okay, okay. So I'm like, oh, this is a drum machine. This is what that do. Oh, this is a mixer. This is what that do. Okay, okay, cool. So I had a little money saved up. So I just went and bought everything that I saw the dude had in his house. So I go and I plug everything up, and I think I'm doing it. I'm at my boyfriend's house. I'm sitting on the floor. I got, I got my keyboard. I'm just, and I'm sitting right like in front of like watching like Rap City and stuff, and I'm just right in front, and I'm playing. And I haven't been like classically trained in the, in the piano or nothing like that, but I just knew I was going to do it. Like nobody was telling me nothing. I'm just focused. I'm sampling. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I'm making like five songs a day. I'm rocking. I'm rolling. So I go in my car, and I listen to the songs that I recorded. But they didn't sound like the song sound on the radio. So I'm like, hold up, hold up, something wrong. Something wrong. I thought I had the album. Like the album was done in like a day. So I go and listen. I'm like, <laughs> so I'm like, listen, I'm letting my friends hear it. They're like, okay, you cool, you cool. So I, I put it together. I was like, oh, my beats are whack. Because I thought I had just bought the machines and stuff and it was just going to come out being fire. And I, I was doing it. So I was like, oh, okay, my beats are whack. I guess I got to chill out for a little bit with the writing and stop trying to do an album in a week and just really take some time to really cultivate what it is that I'm trying to do. So I slowed down, really started listening to music a, a lot more, stopped writing every day, and I really just put a lot more time in, you know, listening, listening to different sounds, just putting a lot more energy into sculpting the different sounds and making the beats and stuff.